The Reservoir is a short story written by Janet Frame. It first appeared in the New Yorker magazine in 1963, but later that same year was republished in a short story collection entitled The Reservoir, Stories and Sketches. It tells the story of a group of unnamed young children in the writer's native New Zealand during one hot school summer holiday. The family has recently moved from a more rural area to a town where water is supplied straight to each house via a network of underground pipes from a reservoir, which is a large man-made lake, rather than having to be pumped by hand, presumably from a well. This feat of human engineering plays a central role in their lives. It not only provides them with a supply of clean drinking water straight from the tap, but because they are prohibited to go there due to it being a drowning risk, it also furnishes them with a focus for their vivid imaginations. It becomes forbidden fruit as they build it up into a place of secrecy and intrigue, a place that they dread yet to which they are simultaneously drawn. It is an especially long, hot summer which makes the children exhausted, yet restless. Bored of their Christmas presents and even of their games of make-believe where they pretend to be adults, they yearn to return to the coolness, structure and novelty of school. They're disappointed, however, as the highly infectious viral disease infantile paralysis, now more commonly known as polio, strikes the town and closes the school, forcing them to do lessons at home. One particularly hot day, the children abandon their studies to go down to the creek. It seems almost inevitable that one of them suggests that they defy their parents' orders and follow its course as far as the reservoir. Not without some misgivings, they embark on the journey which takes them through countryside which feels foreign and at times threatening. When they finally reach the reservoir, its mundane appearance and calm surface is somewhat of an anticlimax, as they decide that there is nothing remarkable, and therefore nothing terrifying about it, after all, as long as it remains undisturbed. They suddenly get the feeling that it's got darker, and that they must have been absent for hours. They run home, only to discover, when they get there, that the sun has barely changed its position in the sky after all. They debate whether they should come clean or not to their parents about where they have been, but their decision is made for them as their mother remarks that they haven't been gone for very long at all. As both of their parents warn them that they'd better not have been anywhere near the reservoir, they come to the conclusion that, like the reservoir, there is only danger when the status quo is disturbed. Confessing where they have been will just cause a lot of trouble, as their parents are out of date and just won't understand that there is nothing to be scared of. Their clandestine visit to the reservoir is to remain just that. Frame utilises an unnamed first-person narrator who, from the information we are given and the language that is used, we are able to infer is an older person looking back on the time when she was a young girl growing up with a large number of siblings. The story is told almost exclusively using the first-person plural we, and none of these siblings is named, the writer preferring to refer to them as somebody or one of us. Not only does this create a very impressionistic feel of someone narrating a memory, but it also evokes the camaraderie of a band of brothers and sisters who act collectively. Frame's diction mixes informal childhood vocabulary and rhymes, such as boiled lolly pink, Frenchies, which is slang for condoms, and inky pinky I smell stinky, with more formal advanced vocabulary, e.g. gaunt, dispelled and disarray, to name but a few, to evoke a world seen through the eyes of a child, but retold by an adult. The text is littered with rhetorical questions, e.g. What was it? Was it sleeping in the reservoir? Was that why people were afraid of the reservoir? To recreate the children's innocence, naivety, curiosity, 
fears and frustrations as they try to make sense of and navigate their way through a world of incomplete information which is often puzzling. Literary devices such as personification and pathetic fallacy feature predominantly and help to vividly evoke the children's perspective. Although it can't, strictly speaking, be described as a coming-of-age story, as these tend to have teenagers as protagonists and focus on the transition between adolescence and adulthood, it is a story about rebellion, loss of innocence and the start of the children's journey to independence as they transition from childhood to adolescence. Adolescence is generally marked as a time of questioning of rules that are seemingly arbitrarily set down by adults and of increased risk-taking behaviour, which is hidden from adults. This first time that the children deliberately break one of the commandments that have been laid down by their parents could therefore be described as a rite of passage, as this is the first step on the path of self-empowerment. The reservoir becomes a powerful metaphor that is central to the story, symbolising both a physical and a psychological border between the world they know and the world beyond, which is a foreign and grown-up land. It also symbolises both life, in that it is an essential water source for the town, and death, in that its calm surface hides dangerous depths that bring with them the risk of drowning. During adolescence, Frame herself tragically lost, in two separate incidents, her sisters Myrtle and Isabel to drowning, and this is perhaps why water imagery features so prominently in her work. There's also the potential link, although this is never explicitly stated, between the creek, which flows with the untreated cast-off water from the reservoir, and the epidemic of polio as one of the virus's known causes of transmission is through contaminated water. There is a suggestion, perhaps, that we are so focused on creating dangers that don't exist, that we are unable to see the ones that are under our very noses. It's a story that has resonance today, some 60 years after it was written, with its backdrop of modernisation and human technology, long boiling hot summers, and rumours about the sea drying up between New Zealand and Australia being just as relevant now as the climate change crisis dominates the news cycle. The infantile paralysis epidemic and homeschooling are also reminiscent of the COVID-19 pandemic and the enforced national lockdowns and school closures. Frame establishes right at the beginning of the story the importance of the forbidden reservoir and the sense of mystique surrounding it. Note the way in which it is capitalised throughout, which indicates this significance, not only to the children, but also to the adults. The gully and the creek to which the children are permitted to go is also central, as it is not only a reference point for them, but it will also eventually, in the same way that the yellow brick road leads Dorothy to Oz and her own coming of age, lead them to the reservoir itself. The story begins, it was said to be four or five miles along the gully. The phrase, it was said to be, makes it clear that the narrator has not been to the reservoir herself. Her reliance on hearsay creates a sense of mystery, almost as though it is a place of myth and legend. She also makes clear the perspective of the story's narrative voice that it is an adult looking back on her childhood, as she explicitly acknowledges her own and her siblings' innocence and ignorance of the world beyond their immediate small-town environment. The squatters of the land who were the rabbits eating like modern sculpture into the hills, for how could we know anything of modern sculpture? We knew nothing but the statue of the warrior in the main street with his wreaths of poppies on Anzac Day. Frame indicates early on that this story is going to be about parental authority and the way in which children begin to push against the idea that respect is synonymous with unquestioning compliance with their rules. 
the gnomes weeping in the gardens because the seagulls perched on their green caps and showed no respect, i.e. they poop on them which runs down their cheeks looking like tears, and how important it was for birds, animals and people, especially children, to show respect. Note the exclamation mark here which communicates the tone in which she remembers her parents lecturing her, presumably accompanied by a disapproving wagging finger. The way the next paragraph begins, and that is why for so long we obeyed the command of the grown-ups and never walked as far as the forbidden reservoir, a phrase which punctuates the early part of the story on a number of occasions, foreshadows their almost inevitable breaking of this cardinal rule. The reservoir is both a physical and a psychological boundary for the children. The reservoir was the end of the world. Beyond it, you fell. It is the limit of their known world, beyond which is, therefore, a foreign country, filled with paddocks of thorns, strange cattle, strange farms, legendary people whom we would never know or recognise, even if they walked among us on a Friday night downtown. The idea of the reservoir hangs over them constantly. It haunted our lives. It's regarded with almost religious reverence by her parents, whose threat that, should the children leave a tap on, they'll be to blame for it running dry, frightens them that they might die of thirst like the 19th century explorers, Burke and Wills in the desert. For the children, it is also a place of subterfuge, where the night men in light blue uniforms with sacks over their shoulders crept beyond the circle of pine trees which enclosed it and emptied the contents of their sacks into the water to dissolve dead bodies and prevent the decay of teeth. The reservoir which supplies pure water, water safe to drink without boiling it, is, however, also a place of more obvious danger, where it is reported that children have been drowned This is a topic of conversation amongst the mothers who all agree that no child ought to be allowed near the reservoir. The purity of the reservoir water is contrasted with the water from the creek which flowed through the gully, which, they are told, has not been treated, but where they are nevertheless given the freedom to play, even though it contains on occasion the latest dead sheep and the stink of its bloated flesh. The children love the creek and its abundance of nature, both beautiful and macabre, demonstrated in the long sentences containing clauses punctuated by semicolons, which provide a vivid and detailed description. We knew where the water was shallow and could be paddled in, where forts could be made from the rocks. We knew the frightening deep places where the eels lurked and the weeds were tangled in gruesome shapes, and so on. Note how they personify it. We knew the moods of the creek, as though it is someone who can be understood and with whom they are in tune. The summer holidays, which take place in December and January in the Southern Hemisphere, arrive, and to begin with, the children are content to stay within the confines of their garden, reading the book that the narrator has won at school and playing at the gully. For so long, then, we obeyed our parents and never walked as far as the reservoir. A psychological shift happens, however, which coincides with the change in the weather. The days became unbearably long and hot, at the same time as they begin to reject the trappings and mundane activities of childhood. Our Christmas presents were broken or too boring to care about. Days at the beach were tedious and even role-play such as those games where we mimicked grown-up life, loving and divorcing each other, kissing and slapping, taking secret paramours when our husband was working out of town, are no longer satisfying. There is a sense that they are stuck in limbo, exhausted yet restless, as they outgrow all of this, needing the authenticity of more grown-up pursuits. Note the pathetic fallacy as the outside world reflects this feeling of their current life having nothing left to give. As cracks appeared in the earth, the grass was bled yellow, the ground was littered with beetle shells and snail shells. 
It gets to the point where they are desperate to go back to school. Not only will it be a respite from the heat, for lessons gave shade to rooms and corridors. Cloak rooms were cold and sunless. But it will also provide new experiences. What was school like? It seemed so long ago. It seemed as if we had never been to school. Surely we had forgotten everything we had learned. How frightening, thrilling and strange it would all seem. They are to be disappointed, however, because the schools did not reopen, as swiftly, suddenly, disease came to the town, infantile paralysis. Polio, of which there were seven outbreaks in New Zealand between 1916 and 1956, is a highly infectious viral disease with symptoms similar to flu. But if it attacks the central nervous system, it can cause paralysis, breathing difficulties and death. Note the way Frame uses the adjective black, both literally and metaphorically, to communicate the sense of fear that swept the nation. Black headlines in the paper listing the number of cases, the number of deaths. Instead of returning to school, they are sent work to do by post, but these lessons in smudged print on rough white paper seemed makeshift and false. They inspired distrust. They could not compete with the sun still shining, swelling. The world would go up in cinders. The days were too long. There was nothing to do. There was nothing to do. Note the way in which Frame utilises comma splicing here and repetition to create a sense of momentum to evoke the children's growing sense of frustration, restlessness and impending doom. One day it just gets all too much for them when even the personified warped wood of the house cracked its knuckles out of boredom. And so they decide to abandon their studies to go down to the gully. It's interesting to note that the children don't go there with the intention of breaking the rules, even at this point. When the mother gives them the customary warning, they dismiss it as there was enough to occupy us along the gully without our visiting the reservoir such as spying on and making fun of courting couples and robbing the orchards of apples. Note how Frame vividly evokes this period of childhood when the children are old enough to be aware that every man and woman did it. We knew that for a fact, although they are too young to fully grasp its technical details. They are fascinated, horrified, confused and embarrassed in equal measure by their idea of sex as they snigger in Woolworths at the counter selling condoms or Frenchies, sing rude songs. Pound shillings and pence, a man fell over the fence. He fell on a lady and squashed out a baby, pound shillings and pence. And worry, what if a man fell on us like that and squashed out a chain of babies? Unfortunately, there are neither couples to torment nor apples to steal, and so it's only a matter of time before someone, sister or brother, said, let's go to the reservoir. Note how this suggestion is received with a feeling of dread, as they realise that the moment of going to the reservoir has finally arrived. The children reveal that they are ambivalent about it, seeing it as a rite of passage akin to leaving school, getting a job, marrying as they know that going there is not only inevitable, but is also irreversible and will forever change them. The group of children bicker for a while, coming up with reasons as to why they shouldn't go, i.e. that they've been told not to and it's a long way, and try changing the subject. Talk of Billy Whitaker and his gang having been there leads them to talk about his having been in an iron lung due to infantile paralysis. Again, the narrator reminds us of the children's innocence and the way in which this makes the wider world by turns both frightening and alluring, as tales of it roused our envy just as much as our dread. An iron lung is a mechanical respirator, consisting of a large horizontal cylinder which assists breathing using changes of air pressure, in which the patient has to lie continually and no doubt extremely traumatising, frustrating, uncomfortable and claustrophobic experience for the patient. 
The children, however, see it as something akin to a treat, which marks the patient out as somehow special. Some people were lucky. None of us dared to hope that we would ever be surrounded by the glamour of an iron lung. We would have to be content all our lives with paltry flesh lungs. The decision is finally taken to go, even though we had not quelled all our misgiving. And the narrator imagines what they will find there. I thought it was a bundle of darkness and great wheels which peeled and sliced you like an apple and drew you toward them with demonic force. Note how the narrator's language changes as they advance beyond their immediate environment of wild sweet peas, clumps of cutty grass, horse mushrooms, ragwort, gorse, cabbage trees. The listing of the familiar plants almost enveloping them like a comfort blanket. Until at the end of the gully we came to a strange territory. And the imagery becomes much more threatening as despite the burning summer temperatures they feel cold though the sun stayed in the sky. Note the personification here as the barbed wire tears at their skin and the bare roots of the gigantic trees that, like the giants of fairy tales lived with their heads in the sky, are in a macabre simile, like bones with the flesh cleaned from them. They manage to escape the unwelcome attentions of a bull which is pouring the ground in preparation for a charge and they momentarily lose the creek between deep banks. When it finally re-emerges on the other side of the bull paddock, they realise that it had undergone change. It had adopted the shape, depth, mood of foreign water, foaming in a way we did not recognise as belonging to our special creek, giving no hint of its depth. Where they used to be able to read its moods, it now seems to not wish any more to communicate with us. Their dismay does not last long, however, and they soon grew cheerful. Frame skillfully evokes how the children continue to chat, talk over, tease each other and bicker as they advance along the creek's course towards the reservoir. The absence of reporting clauses and the proliferation of ellipses in the section of direct speech, which goes on for more than a page, recreates the fragmentary, free association, free-for-all of childish conversation as they switch from subject to subject and jostle to be heard to give the reader a snapshot of the issues which concern these young children. The natural world around them, relationships, the meanings and pronunciations of words, and the infantile paralysis epidemic. Their attention is drawn back to the creek, as to their relief it is once more in a state of recognisable high flow. Yes, there were bubbles on the surface and the water was turning muddy. Our doubts were dispelled. It was the same old creek. This feeling doesn't last for long, however, as it soon deserts them, its job done, leaving them among the pine trees, a narrow strip of them, beyond which lay a vast surface of sparkling water, dazzling our eyes, its centre chopped by tiny grey waves. Not a lake, nor a river, nor a sea. The reservoir. They gaze with wonder at the body of water in front of them and try to reconcile what they can see with the fear that has been generated in them by the adults. We could see the water clearly now. It lay, except for the waves beyond the shore, in an almost perfect calm which we knew to be deceptive. Else why were people so afraid of the reservoir? In the absence of obvious signs of anything terrifying, the children instead listen to the sounds made by the personified fringe of young pines on the edge, which, subjected to the wind, sighed and told us their sad secrets. Note the hissing sibilance here, which has an onomatopoeic effect to evoke the melancholy sound of the wind in the trees. The children come to the realisation that the reservoir is a Pandora's box something which is harmless while left alone and only dangerous when opened, or in this case awakened like a sleeping beast. The trees sighed and told us to be quiet, hush, as if something was sleeping and should not be disturbed. Perhaps that was what the trees were always telling us, to hush, in case we disturbed something which must never ever be awakened. 
Note the sibilant onomatopoeia here, which picks up the sibilants earlier in the paragraph. Emboldened and overcome with sudden glee, we climbed through the fence and swung on the lower branches of the trees, shouting at intervals, gazing possessively and delightedly at the sheet of water with its wonderful calm and menace. Suddenly, though, they feel that the day has become darker, and they run home, haphazardly retracing their steps. When they arrive back, however, they realise that the sun was still in the same place in the sky, after all, and that they haven't been gone for as long as they think they have. The story ends as they momentarily debate whether they should come clean about where they have been. But the answer was decided for us by their parents both warning them that they had better not have been anywhere near the reservoir. If the journey to the reservoir has taught them anything, it is that it is sometimes better to let sleeping dogs lie, and that if you don't disturb the beast, it won't be able to harm you. There is nothing to be gained, and an awful lot to be lost, from telling them as they come to the conclusion that their fear stems from hopelessly out-of-date information. You get the feeling that this is only the first of many infractions of rules imposed by what they see as an out-of-touch older generation. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.